paranormal. It surrounds us. It's everywhere. Tonight, you will hear from the people who live and work within these highly active locations. All in the efforts to discover America's most haunted, most haunted, most haunted. with your host, ghost hunter and author, Dan Terry. Good evening, ghosts and ghouls, and all you creatures that stalk me in my nightmares. Let me tell you now, I won. Get over it. Go back to hell. Leave me alone. And for everyone else, welcome. Glad you made it back. Now, we had a little bit of an issue. My guest was uh, scheduled to be Dustin Crowley, and if he's any relation to Alistair Crowley, I have got to explore that. But uh, Dustin is the founder of Great State Paranormal, and he came down with the Kung Flu. I'm afraid COVID is not done with us yet. So he's down. He couldn't make it. I called my good friend, Dr. Mark Farley with the St. Louis Paranormal Research Society, and he's ready and willing to come in and talk to you all. And what we're going to talk about this time, you know what? I, I said it. I'm going to call it that defense against the dark arts. But Mark said this is a spiritual defense uh, for when you're ghost hunting, using a Ouija board or whatever. Mark, and if you have not seen the video I did in his Ouija board museum, go back about three weeks. It's up there. And it's incredible. Mark has been a good friend of mine for many years. I've worked with his team over and over again. They've invited me to some of the most incredible places, the, the Fox Theater and uh, the Onondaga Cave. And uh, there's another theater. I want to call it uh, the Bissell Theater. It used to be called something else, and I can't remember it now, but I've been in some amazing places with him. He is the founder, again, of St. Louis Paranormal Research Society, does the ghost tours of the Lamp Mansion, the Lamp Neighborhood, and the Lamp Brewery, as well as the Fox Theater in October and several other places. So let's bring Mark Farley on. Hey, Dan, how you doing? There you are, buddy. How's it going? Yeah. Pretty good, Dan. Pretty good. Yeah, how, how How is the ghost business there i mean you you were doing uh well you invited me to a corn cob pipe factory a few months ago and uh man there's been so much you've done have you been exploring and and fighting you know, the evil well we've been um right now is tour season um, tours are doing great we're doing tour season we are trying to get into a place that you've been trying to get into for a long time yes at the white house hotel in herman and I am working with on that only because they contacted me and okay. uh, they, I gave them all the confidence in you I've got. And I think they're ready to go. They're wanting to get in there before October, before, yeah. you know, all that. And, uh, you know, if we can set up a time, I can get down there. <laughs> I'll be down there for it. You know that. Well, I know and the for, corn cob pipe factory. You're down here in 24 hours. Yeah, <laughs> said, yeah. From notice, you got it. Yeah. I mean, that was that's another place. Another place I wanted to go into. Yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, let's move along. And you have been doing a lot on. Well, I guess you have to because of the Ouija board museum you're sitting in yeah. right now. Oh, yeah. But you've been doing a lot with defense against spiritual attack. Would that be right. a good way of putting it? Or sp spiritual attachments, and that's I do I do these um, events about once a month. They're an open house event. They're free. I invite people to come, and our office gets to be only standing room only. And I do a I do a yeah. lecture. Last month's lecture or June's lecture was about spiritual defense, how to prevent spiritual attachments to you. And I get over the years. I'm sure you've gotten this too, being a paranormal investigator. People call you, they, they claim they have something attached to them. And every time that I try to talk to them, it goes down the same path. I call, I'm usually not the first person they call. I'm usually like the sixth or seventh person they call. 
and I've done that. I did this. I they said that don't work. I called this psychic. They and they want something that I just cannot give them. A miracle cure. A miracle cure, like a, a magic bullet. So as over my years as a paranormal investigator and dealing with these type of attachments, I kind of came up with a basic playbook. But the problem is. It doesn't have the sensationalism that they want, you know, and every time I deal with somebody with that thinks they have a spiritual attachment to them, they always say it's demonic. I'm demonic. It's demonic. Yes. I'm like, I'm like, I, I don't think so. <laughs> You're not. It doesn't. Demonic possession follows every every type of attachment. I broke it down to four has a very specific line of events that happen right and you're not trust me you don't have a demonic attachment to that, right? <laughs> but then they well, that, they, they hang, are they rare hang. but they happen they do happen i'm not saying they don't happen they're but they are rare very rare and these just i don't know people think that i'm going to do I, they have a lot of misconceptions and i find out these misconceptions and beliefs and just, I'm going to use the term ignorance, for lack of a better term, aids in perpetuating this attachment. Mm -hmm. And I really just came down to a very simple reason that spirit attachments happen. Okay. And a lot of people, so I did this lecture, a lot of people love this lecture. I actually had some people that were really offended by this lecture. And it's like... Well, it's what I, you know, it's just, I don't, I don't know why you're so offended. I guess because in the paranormal, a lot of people get rooted in these beliefs and especially some of these so-called psychics, I'm going to call them, mm -hmm. they get like, they're this uber, well, I don't know, whatever, you know, and, and when you buck against their supernatural powers, I guess they get really offended by it. I've noticed over the years, just my own take on the matter is that they want to be special. You're, you're, you know what, Dan? You, you hit the nail on the head. And when they find out that I can do with a pair of rods what they think is their God-given ability, and it is if they're true psychic, that's something yeah. I don't deal with. I, I don't have that ability. But I can do it with a set of rods. You can do it with a pendulum or rods or whatever you use. Some people do it with electrical devices. You're not special anymore if we can all do it. And you know, I've noticed this too. The really, really good, the, the really good legitimate psychics, they're the quiet ones. It's the ones that got to be the center of attention and the ones that, you know, you kind of, you're fake. You know, they're, you're, <laughs> you're, covering, you're covering for something. Yes. Yeah. And but it's the, the quiet ones are the ones that I've noticed that are, that don't have to be the center of attention. Mm -hmm. That don't brag about how powerful they are and... No, most of them say, I, I'm getting this, but it could mean other things. I don't know what it means. This is what I'm seeing. You figure it out. Yeah. So, yeah. So how do we do it? How do we defend ourselves? Well, you know, I look, as I was doing my research, the best way to prevent a spirit or spiritual attachment is flat out avoidance. <laughs> Avoid those situations. Uh, but, you know, we're ghost hunters. That's not what we do. And it just seems like in the paranormal, if you weren't demonic, every ghost hunter wants to run towards that. Every sure. ghost hunter, that's the, you know, we got to go there. We got to investigate this. And, and honestly, if they came against a real demonic possession, they'll lose. Oh, they're, they'll lose every time. Every and chances time. are they make it worse and they get themselves in trouble. That's, now, years years okay. ago, I dealt with a guy who had his own team. It was in the St. Louis area. It's not there anymore. Yeah. And he kept telling me how much he wanted to fight a demon. He was cheating on his wife with a married woman. You are not ready to deal with demonics. No. And they, you cannot, and I told him this, and I, I upset him. You can't cut their heads off. This is not Buffy the Vampire Slayer. You, They will attack you through your bank account, through your, your money, through your health of your children, the health of your spouse. They will do the dirtiest things to get you, and you're not ready for this. 
Oh no, they will. You're right. I had, I was at a lecture. This is before I really became known in the paranormal in the St. Louis area. Well, I was at a lecture and this guy, this 21 year old kid comes up and I'm going to call him a kid. For, and he yeah. comes up wearing a, he had a, like a, a leather trench coat on a priest <laughs> collar, black, blue jeans and dirty Converse tennis shoes. I think okay. I know him. <laughs> yeah. He walked up on stage and he says, I am a Catholic exorcist. Oh, dear. I kind of picked up on because I'm I've been cat I'm Catholic, right? And I'm like, well, okay, okay. So I, I'm listening to his lecture, and he literally holds his phone up, and he says, "I have a phone. Before I do an exorcism, I must call the Vatican." And I go, "You got the Vatican's number on your phone?" I raised my hand up. He said, "Yes." I said, "Call it, call it." And he goes, no, I don't want to call it. We'll just get an answering machine. I said, I'll listen to the Pope's answering machine. <laughs> um, so he literally opens his coat up. And I guess he wa- he saw too many Constant- read too many Constantine comics or saw the movie too many times. Oh, he had these vials of holy water, wooden stakes, crucifixes. And I know it was bullshit because he had the mm. King James Bible. Catholics okay. don't use the King James. <laughs> Catholics use your own Bible, and the exorcism is not in the Catholic Bible. It's in a separate this is a separate book called the Rites and Ritual Manual. Mm-hmm. And I said, "Where's your Rites and Rituals Manual at?" And he goes, "He didn't know what I was talking about." Of um, course. And basically, they asked me to leave the lecture. They threw me out, and I learned a lesson then. But I was just like, oh, my God, these people are just lapping this up. I mean, I'm like, this guy hasn't told you anything factual about it. He just saw it Catholic and they believed it. You have got to. Sometime when we're talking over a beer, you got to tell me who would bring this petulant oh. child in as an, as an exorcist. Because he has not dealt with a demon or he would be going down oh. in his britches. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I, I honestly, if somebody says they have a demonic possession, I really don't. I don't deal with it. Yeah. I advise them two things. One, seek spiritual help. Two, um, seek medical help. Because if it's, and we'll talk about this later, but if it's some sort of psychosis, me saying it's demonic, I'm just making their situation way worse. Yes. You know. You know and, and you know, me, I've dealt with one, maybe. But I called the experts in and said, hey, you guys deal with this. I don't have the clue. When I figured out what it might be, I'm done. I'm out. I, oh. I am not up for this. I don't want to deal with it. I really don't. Because I know, as much as I know, I know enough to get myself in a lot more in a lot of trouble. Uh, yeah, that's you kind know? of the way I see it. So the thing is, seek spiritual help. I'll guide them where they need to go. Mm-hmm. But... Other than that, that's all I can do for you. So other than avoidance, because as you said, we're not going to do that. Yeah. What's, what's next? What else can we do? Well, what I found out was that a spiritual attachment or any type of attachment is two things. It takes two things for it to happen. One, an invitation. You extend an invitation to it. And I learned that from years of dealing with Ouija, doing work in Ouija boards, an invitation. I've seen so many people get themselves in trouble with Ouija boards. Mm-hmm. And here's a simple, and here's as simple as an invitation it can be. Show me a sign and knock on the wall. You just invited that spirit out of the Ouija board into our realm. The okay. same thing with during spirit communicate, because a lot of people ghost hunters I find through spirit communication and people think if they're using a Sony, they're using a pendulum, they're doing, using the rods. As long as they're not using the Ouija board, they're safe. That is, that is dead wrong. It's all the same. All yeah. spirit yeah. Just, it's all dangerous. It works better and, for me to use rods, but yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah. And the thing is first you extend an invitation and the second, the spirit makes a choice. Okay. And those two, 
is what what is needed to make a spirit attachment happen. Okay. I've seen this, and this is something I've been noticing on ghost tours a lot lately. People have been coming on ghost tours and saying, you can use some of my energy. Oh, I've I'm seen there, people do that. And I'm there like, oh, woman, or I'm like, you really don't know what you're saying. You have just made a carte blanche invitation to have something come attached to you. Yes. And I'm just like, I, I try telling them, but no one ever listens in a ghost tour because I'm just a stupid tour guy. You know? <laughs> and they're the experts since they paid to be there. Out on uh, Enoch's Knob Bridge, I heard a lady offer to let a ghost take over her body to tell us his story. And I'm, no, he, you're not. <laughs> it's no, no. not going to happen. So I found that I, that's the two things. That's and it's really that simple. Uh huh. There's no. I hear this. I think the ghost is going to spirits follow me home. I'm like, why? especially I hear this at the Lent Mansion. I'm like, <laughs> why are they following you? They live. They're in a mansion. See, you live in a trailer in Jeffco. Why would they follow you home? What is the, there? Has to be an invitation and a choice. And usually with there's, you know, I broke it down to like angelic encounters, spiritual attachment, malevolent spirits and demonic possession. Okay. Usually with a spiritual encounter, there is a, there, each one has a specific reason of why it has reason why, but with a spirit, with a spiritual encounter or a spiritual attachment, there has to be some sort of reason. Usually there's an emotional bond or emotional attachment. That causes that. A lot of times I found standard spirit attachments being, you know, Grandma May passed on, your grand, your favorite granddaughter. There's mm -hmm. a reason why she's attached to you. And usually it's an emotional bond. And there's something that she either she's trying to convey, she's worried that, you know, if she leaves, you're gonna suffer some sort of Life's going to be harder for you. I don't know. Reasons why grandmothers <laughs> stay with grandchildren. But with spiritual attachments, I found usually there's some sort of emotional attachment reason. Once you figure out that reason, it's very easy to break that attachment. Mm -hmm. And same thing with a haunted house. Same, and the, same thing with, with houses. A haunted house is just a spirit attachment to a location, to a house. Okay. Um, but... The, the one, first one, the most rare one that came out was angelic encounters. Mm -hmm. And I started researching this about a year ago. I had, I do seances here in my seance, seance room, in my Ouija room here. And I had, a, a, she was a California psychic. Okay. So she books four tickets. And then 15 minutes later, she's sending me these emails and I didn't catch, I, I didn't, I didn't reply to the email because I didn't check my email. <laughs> so, but in a few hours, this escalated to that I was the biggest ripoff in the world because she thought she was going to be doing these in the Lent Mansion instead of the Lent Brewery. Okay. If she would have read the, the event listing, she would have known this. But mm -hmm. she was telling me that she was going to have her angels attack me. And I said, you're powerful enough to command angels. Could angels you? attack humans? You attack me, yeah. Angels, to I'm gonna, guardians. Her angel. She's going to send her angels to attack. Me. So I she's said, got her own unit. Kind of yeah. an A-team. I said, so you can command spiritual beings that have seen the face of God <laughs> to attack me. Messengers... Servants of God, they're going to listen to you over the Almighty Creator and come at that. <laughs> so I, I researched it, and what I found out for this angelic encounters are usually very short lived. Mm -hmm. They're very specific. They're they're there to fix. They're task or task orientated. They're there to deal with one particular problem. That's it. Right. And the thing is, an angelic encounter is not there necessarily to benefit you. 
it's you got to kind of look as the greater good it's mm-hmm. trying to fix something that's very specific and you're not the particular focus of it you may be wrapped up in it but it's it's there's they're just and once and once the task is done the encounter is done and people really got upset about that they thought angels were there to protect them and angels are there to guide them i'm not saying angels don't do that yeah but most of the most of the time angels are (laughs) they're there for a particular reason and they leave (laughs) so there is a war if you believe in that between good and evil yeah they don't have time to bring you cookies that's no. not what they're here for. And you know, who uh, was it? St. Augustine, I think, because I'm 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 doctor of philosophy. There was a very interesting discussion we had in in, in grad school about him. St. Augustine, since the devil was actually an angel and created by God, yes, everything that God has created has some level of good. Satan being the least amount, God being the, the pure, you know, 100%. And I, I always found that kind of interesting. Can the devil do good? He does have good in him. If that's true, he was created by God. He does have a level amount of good in him. And now, of course, in some faiths, uh, he was the adversary. He wasn't so evil as he was just... A prosecutor in the big yes. trial of your soul. I've heard that too. He was there to. He's kind of the one that argues against you, right? You know, and he's the one that weighs you. And, yes. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I think we. I you know. I I knew a Catholic priest, Father Keaton, and he was on his. He was he was dying. Okay. And a kidney failure, and. He's and one of his last things he ever said to me was, "I'm probably going to find out we've been doing it wrong all along." <laughs> and I said, "You're probably right, Father." You know, so, but yeah, angelic encounters are not what you think. Right. They are. Um, they're very. I mean, and then you have spiritual attachments. This is what we talked about before. They're usually there's a reason for them. Um, usually most spiritual attachments are people that you know. And these are common spirits like your grandmother or family members or just normal Joes. I mean, I'm not talking about something malevolent. I'm talking about your general Caspers, for lack, again, for lack of Perfect word. Yeah. Um, And they're not there to harm you. They're usually there for some sort of emotional bond, or they think they need to protect you or guide you, or they're not necessarily bad. They're not bad. Mm-hmm. I want, they're not life threatening. They're not harmful to you. They're not there to disrupt your life. It's just that most of us have this pre programmed notion that anything paranormal is automatic. And that, you know, that comes from Hollywood and that comes from every sure. ghost that we've ever heard. And, and the church taught that we were not to deal with these things. It, it, honestly, you're right. You're not supposed to deal with spirits. You're supposed to avoid the situation. And, and really, that's kind of good advice because you avoid it. You never have to worry about these situations. So we're so. not going to do that. So <laughs> again, no. we should avoid crime too, but you know, that's part of being a cop. We are helping people. So we have to be in the middle of it. We should avoid sex if you want to avoid, you know, <laughs> <laughs> pregnancy and all the things that come with it. But um, but you're not going to do that either. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. So once you discover the reason, and with these two, I find this out too. Before you go down this path, find out whether it's, have, remove that person from the location, from their home, uh-huh. and see if it follows them. If it doesn't follow them, you're dealing with a haunted house, and then you take steps. It's a lot easier dealing with a haunted house than it is dealing with a, a spiritual attachment to a person. Okay. So that's the first thing. Find out exactly what you're dealing with. Um, but then you have malevolent spirits. 
Now, malevolent spirits and demonic possession, they have two different goals. The purpose of a malevolent attachment is not to kill you. Is not is it may harm you is to elicit emotional responses from you because we think of it a malevolent spirit feeds off energy it feeds off your battery to it yes and so it wants you it wants to scare you it wants you in this perpetual state of anxiety fear so it can just it can feed off you and the more it can feed off you the greater the attachment to you. So first thing you need to do when you deal with a malevolent attachment is one, understand it's not going to give you up easily. It's not going to give that person up easily because you're its energy source. You're, it's, you're, you're, the, you're its battery. Mm -hmm. So, and what I found out that, okay, I'm, I'm sure you've seen this in your investigations with a house. People come in with sage, they sage the house, a day or so goes by, everything's peaceful, then everything starts back up again. Yes. Okay. Because what you what they failed to do is I always view like sage as a knockdown. Then once you knock it down, take control of it, then you have to do things to prevent it from coming back. Mm -hmm. Now with spiritual attachments, what I found find out is the longer they deal with these attachments, they live in this heightened anxiety, stressful, exi fearful existence, they start developing habits to the the kind of um, mitigate what's happening to them. And these habits tend to, will start promoting this attachment. So what you need to do is one, you're just not going to break this attachment. It's not a one and done. What breaks these type of attachments is over time. You're going to have to continually break these atta this attachment. So you may break it for a day, and then the next day it comes back. You may break it for a day and a half, and the next day it comes back. And because you have, they have to, one, stop inviting it back. And they may be doing it unconsciously. They may be doing it through these habits they developed. They may, some people, when they have an attachment and they're going through this, they're the center of attention. Every ghost yeah. group wants to deal with them. So they may not want to break the attachment. And right. then that's a perpetual invitation. And of course, once the spirit finds somebody they can feed off of, they're not going to give it up. Or malevolent spirit, they're not going to give that up. Let me let me clarify something real quick. By malevolent spirit, are you talking about an angry human spirit, or is this something beyond humans? It could be. I, I'm going to say beyond human. Okay. It could be something, an angry human spirit that is beyond something normal. Um. Maybe something that they practice more in the dark arts and they maybe were able to acquire some sort of gifts, some sort of abilities through their practice, um, but mainly something beyond, more beyond human. Because I have been able to, with human spirits, reason with them, even though they were doing things that were yeah. kind of mean and, and cruel. Right. When I put it into a context where they could understand it, they usually listened. Well, you found the reason why you came. Yeah. You found the reason, and that you and was a spiritual attachment. Attachment breaks, and here's the thing: if you're an asshole while you're alive, there's a good chance you're going to be an asshole when you're dead. Granted, you know, yes. and so you may just be dealing with an asshole spirit, not in something not necessarily malevolent. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry if I cuss there, but I think we're all adults. <laughs> Yeah, but it's a but, family show, so let's control it. Okay, I will do. But <laughs> if you're dealing with somebody, but if you see what I'm saying, if they're a bad person in life, they're going to be a chances are they're going to be a bad, very good chance they're going to be a bad person. But it's still going to be different from what you're referring to as a malevolent, which Le is lover, with something beyond you, a low level demon or an <sighs> elemental. Do you have a clue? Well, I think, and people label them like. Low, you know, elementals, entities. 
yeah, stuff I'm like not that. sure what an elemental is myself, but right. I, I get the idea of it. I've never dealt with one. There's a hundred different definitions for these things, and we've never nailed it down. But something I'm just going to say something that's more than human. Okay. Okay. And so, first of all, you 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 got to stop. You got to stop the invitation. You guys, you guys break their habits and chances are, this is not going to be something the longer it runs, the harder it is to break that attachment. Okay. Okay. Because one, it gets stronger and it becomes very, you said this before too, it, it becomes very per pervasive in their lives. Yes. It starts altering their, it, it tries to isolate the person from anybody that can help them. It becomes very pervasive because as it starts gaining control of your of that person's life, it strengthens its grip on that person. Oh, it sounds like you're talking about the oppression stage of a demon yeah. assault. Well, I'll we'll talk about that too. Um, but in that way, they they kind of but they but a malevolent spirit and a demonic possession have two different purposes. Okay. And I'll explain that and when we talk about that. But as I, as I was saying, they don't want to kill you. They may hurt you, but the ultimate goal of malevolent spirit is not to kill you. It's to keep you alive because as you're alive, it can feed off you. Whereas the demonic possession, it is to kill you. And the reason why is, is the ultimate state, the ultimate thing is to remove your soul from a state of grace and then tear down the body to your die and therefore your soul is damned. Because the ultimate goal of a demonic possession is your soul. Yes. Okay. Is to acquire that. And what you find too is where a malevolent spirit will try to scare you, a demonic spirit will try to. It doesn't want to scare you because if you run away from it, what 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 has it accomplished? It hasn't accomplished anything. It wants to lure you in. It wants to bring you in closer and closer. And demonic possession is always by invitation. It always, you've extended some sort of in, invitation to it. Same thing with a malevolent spirit, but you always extended some sort of invitation to it. And then once you invite it into your life and you allow it to take possession, and then, then it starts wanting to tear the body down. And if you're dealing with a true demonic possession, what you notice is self-harm. They're stop eating. They'll break their teeth or it makes it hard to take nourishment in. Anything that th the, demo the demon, demonic, the demon can do to tear the body down before your soul can get back into a state of grace. And that's why if you ever see a true Catholic exorcism, first thing they must do is gain your permission. You must want to get rid of it. And then once they get, get your permission, they never ask again. They mm -hmm. start True demo, a true Catholic exorcism lasts 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. It does not stop until they they break the possession. And people don't understand the purpose of a Catholic exorcism is not to save your life, it's to save your soul. So, but you notice that you you it it and again. Their demonic possessions are very rare. They're very, um, they do become very pervasive into your life. And the problem is with a demonic possession, and this is where it's very tricky for some somebody like you and me, is that a demonic possession mimics a psychosis. True. Okay, so this person has a psychosis. Now, if it's a mental psychosis, they have a mental illness, you saying it's demonic feeds the psychosis. Okay? But if it's a true demonic, demonic possession and you diagnose it as psychosis, you feed the possession. So you got to be very careful with that. And a lot of times, how do we treat psychosis is with medication. And what that do, does is it subdues the person's will, their ability, their, they may have some mental ability to kind of resist the possession once it starts, but 
medication tends to dull that ability to resist it and just makes the possession happen faster. Okay. So that's the thing. You've got to be very careful with it. And I'm not a medical professional, so I can't make that determination. Well, and even then, the Catholic Church in a, before an exorcism demands a mental evaluation. Right. And they do, and that's the same thing. That's why. Because one, they don't want to be trapped looking looking foolish. But two, they know that they have to be right. Mm -hmm. And I really do. And the thing is, you get these psychics that come in, you know, and the thing is, what is Sage going to do against something that's demonic? You're talking about a fallen angel. Again, you're talking about something that has seen the face of God, seen the face of the devil, that's ancient, infinitely smarter and stronger than you are, and you're going to burn a weed in its weed around it. And it's going to just, <laughs> and you, or you're going to use your super psychic powers to banish it. I watched the video, and this psychic crossed over in 35 seconds, by the way, because I timed it. 4,096 spirits. And banished eight demons. I'm like, Jesus Christ, you must be in the psychic Olympics or something. Like that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I think the uh, St. Louis demonic case took, what, six months or so? It took a while. People don't realize that, too. Yeah. It took it took a while for that to, to resolve that issue. And most possessions don't, the most attachments or possessions don't happen overnight. Don't You can't rid it overnight. You, it takes a long time to get rid of it. And I don't, I, you know, you saw, you got these, I'm going to use spiritual healing and these psychics touch you and the, you're good. And usually what happens is it comes back, it comes back worse. Right. If you think about it. Think about this. So you have a, you have a malevolent attachment. Just some psychic comes up and does spiritual healing. It, if I was a spirit, what I would do is I would relent for a day to come back stronger. And what you're down. doing is you're destroying their confidence. Mm -hmm. Now they're thinking, well, no one can help me. And you become more and more helpless and more and more defeated. And you're, you just strengthened your grip on that person. You know, so. it's, it's incredible. The, I guess you'd say it's a, a snake oil business that has been built around this kind of thing. Yeah. And everybody thinks, and the thing is psychics can't get rid of this. It, you, you have to make a conscious choice to get rid of it. And it's more on the person that the attachments form to than it is on the people that people like me, I can tell you what to do, whether, and I, I will tell them what to do. It's whether or not they listen. I mean, you've been a police officer all your life. How many times have you told them exactly how to get themselves out of trouble? They don't listen to you. No. And what's the end? You're hooking them up and dragging them to jail. Yeah. They, they, they could, you know, they could break that away. chain. They could have walked away and slept in their own bed that night. Instead, they're going to see the judge in the morning. Mm -hmm. you, you're right. You know. So that's what I found with spirit that with people, they, they got to want to listen. They got to really want to get rid of it until they listen, prepared to listen to you. There's nothing I can do to them. I had a woman I on the phone for an hour. I could not convey to her. Well, I did that already. I did that. You got to run the playbook. I don't care what they did. Right. We're going to run my playbook and we may repeat some of the same steps I'd done before, but we're going to, we're going to put, you know, we're putting pins in things. It's like, I kind of, I was an aircraft mechanic for 20 years. I was avionics. I was a troubleshooter and you start isolating problems. Okay. It can't be this. It can't be this. And you start isolating problems. And sometimes you get lucky. You catch it early. Sometimes you got to do a lot of isolation till you find the problem. And usually with spirit, with spiritual attachment, you take, it takes, you, you just got to kind of isolate things and eliminate things as you go down, as you go down. 
and try to figure out what it is. Figure out what the reason is. Figure out what you're actually against first. Because the thing is, if you're thinking you're dealing with a demonic possession, you're just dealing with a stable spiritual attachment, you can make that situation way worse for them. And, you know, it just, I don't know. I don't like dealing with these situations. I, I'm going to go down a real rabbit hole here. Okay. This is going to be an adventure, all right? Ouija board. Should people burn them, get rid of them, not use them, don't buy them, send them to you? What? What? What's always what's send the them. deal? <laughs> yeah, I how, many of, how many of those have you got now? What, about a hundred? I, I got. I got about thirty on the wall here. I got about over hundred. Most yeah, of yeah. people have sent to me. So with Ouija boards. Okay, and I and we talked about this earlier, extending invitations, and this is how people get them themselves in trouble with Ouija boards. But this is also why Ouija boards have a bad name, a, a truly evil name in this. They do, and I tell you why they have a truly evil name. Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, had they made a movie about a little girl getting possessed using the pendulum or dowsing rods, they'd be evil. The second thing is, what's the first spiritual communication tool most people come to con come in contact with? Is a Ouija board. And you know what? I got a board right here, a box right here, and it says eight plus. You got to be eight years old. They're recommended for eight plus. Yeah. I told you a long time ago, I went to uh, Barnes and Noble and they had Hello Kitty Ouija boards on sale. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, but here's the thing when you're a teenager with a Ouija board, are you there to conduct spirit, spirit communication or are you there to get to have a thrill? Yeah. To have fear. And that is the biggest problem with the paranormal. Most people are not investigators. Most people are thrill seekers. They're not there. To, they want to get there and they want it. And it seems like all new investigators go through that thrill seeking stage. That's what brings us in to begin with, at least for yeah. me. Yeah. And what happens is for people to get that thrill, they offer that invitation. They want... I, what they want. Um, I can't think of the word. They want affirmation. Okay. Show me a sign, knock on the wall three times, you know, um, make the, your and every time that isn't make my K2 meter light up. Mm -hmm. How many times have you said that during that investigation? I still do. I mean, that is what the video is for. I mean, you, yeah. people want to see lights. I'm we're the Sesame street generation. We yeah. want to see lights and hear music. They want, yeah, they want to hear the beeps. They want to see the lights. Yeah. And I hate K2 meters. We can do a whole hour on me hating K2 meters. <laughs> and, uh, well, you hide it well because I use it everywhere. So I, Well, people, if you use it correctly, they are a useful tool. But they originally were not designed for paranormal investigation. Right. They were, but, the, with the, but going back to the Ouija boards, you know, your first – your most people's first encounters with spirits have been using the Ouija board. Yes. If you're going to a Ouija to a cemetery at night on Halloween with a Ouija board, you are there to get yourself so scared. And that's how you know uh, Satan came across the Ouija board. And let me tell you, the thing is, why would Satan need something from Parker Brothers to talk to you? <laughs> it's Satan. Satan wants to talk to you. He's pretty much going to come talk to you. I, when I was working for the airlines, I had this I had this guy. And I'm not going to say his name. But he was a Bible thumper. I mean, hard Bible thumper. Okay. And all shift, he wouldn't go out and take a single maintenance call. Because he's in the Bible researching the bible and finally asked us why what's going on here why are you not what why you've been so engrossed in that bible all day he goes last night i think god spoke to me and i laughed at him. i said you know if the creator of the universe had a message for you in particular i'm pretty sure he would convey it to you in a way that there'll be Absolutely no <laughs> doubt that you talk to God. It wouldn't be no think. There would be no research. It would be crystal clear of what he was trying to convey. It's coming you know? out of the burning bush. It's got to yeah. be from God. 
It's going to be no misconceptions, no misunderstandings. It's going to be crystal clear, and you definitely know who the message is going to come from. The same thing with Satan. Why is he going to talk to the board? He's going to – you. You know, and chances are, you if you got Satan tra- talking to you, you're in a world of shit, in, uh, world of hurt. In it, you, know? <laughs> you know, it's like I always said, I know I've said it to you before because I heard it somewhere and I loved it. If you're talking to God, that's prayer. When God talks back, that's schizophrenia. Yeah. Yeah. Because when God, if God speaks back to you, <laughs> there's something, there's, I mean, seriously. <laughs> there's, <laughs> They're either, you're right, schizophrenia, or that's a, you know, that's a moment of, you know, yeah. And really and truly, if you, like an angelic presence, do you really, if you read the Old Testament, do you really want to encounter an angel? Because when God- They were fearsome creatures. When God wants to avenge something, smite something, destroy something, curse something, he sends an angel. (laughs) Angels are not necessarily good things for you, you know. Not necessarily can be. Yeah, God, God is like, go deal with this. (laughs) (laughs) And it's not, and as I said before, an angelic encounter is not necessarily there for your benefit. It's not there to purposely hurt you, but it's not necessarily there to benefit you. you Right. And the bigger picture, if it means you're going to die sacrificed, well, that's the bigger picture is what matters. Right. Just and, like a war general. If I have to f- lose a few people to win this battle, yeah. okay. There's acceptable losses. And there was, uh, during the lecture too, somebody brought up the possession of Emily Rose. That okay. one was a complicated situation. It was a very complicated situation. But during that, I during the lecture, we, in one of the slides, I have a kind of a side note, the Holy Mother, Mary. And during that, there is, if you go back and watch on YouTube, Mary speaks to Emily Rose personally. And she's in the foggy wood there. And Mary comes down and gives Emily a choice. And these are the two choices. This is the two choices he gave, gave her. One, I will remove you from this situation immediately and take you into heaven. He offered her the greatest gift in Catholicism, direct assumption into heaven. Okay. Okay. Or you can stay, be a martyr, and show others what really, what that evil truly does exist, but you will suffer greatly. She chose to stay and suffer for the benefit of all. Okay. And and then people don't realize Mary rewarded her, gave her a promise that she would go to heaven when this is done. And that promise was in a stigmata. stigmata. And that is an encounter with the Holy Mother. Usually you deal with the Holy Mother in when you're dealing with evil. Because in the Catholic religion, it's Mary that deals with the devil, not Jesus. But Mary. Really? I've yes. never heard that before. Mary, because you all the prayers during the exorcism, yeah, they pray to Christ, but they pray to Mary. Mary is the one that puts her foot on the head of the serpent and crushes it. Mary is the one that defends against evil. Uh, again, didn't know it. I was unbaptist, so yeah. I, I was not aware of that. But that's pretty cool. In that, and people, a lot of people are that even Catholics miss that. He, she offered. If that's true, Mary offered her assumption, and that is the greatest gift. And only Mary was assumed. Christ was assumed. I mean, you're up there with some big league hitters when you mm-hmm. when you're granted assumption. So. Okay. Let's uh just for a couple quick minutes, the yeah. the Ouija board became really popular. Well, witch boards became popular. Yeah. After the the big spiritual movement, which was after the Civil War. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, there was a lot of death, a lot of families torn apart. Yes. What's causing the movement now? I really do think that 
couple of reasons. One, ghost hunting has become popular. I mean, there are how many TV shows now? Are Stormy Daniels, the porn star, has her own paranormal show. <laughs> you know? Seriously. Hey, she um, needs money. Come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> She's not uh, getting Ozzy it from a lawyer. Osborne, you know, I watched the commercial, Ozzy, Osborne, Ozzy Osbourne's oh. son. Paranormal is like a box of chocolates. I'm like, <laughs> uh, you know, portal in there. And his um, show is called The Portals to Hell. I'm like, are you kidding me? Um, so, well, he's going well, off on his dad's reputation, of course. Yeah, you know, I'm, he's got to make a buck somehow. <laughs> but I think the popularity is coming back. And you got to understand, everybody to some point has some fascination with the parable. Yes. And I think that's one reason why, because there's a lot more exposure to it. And the thing is, too, is we, we get a lot of more paranormal weird photographs simply because everybody carries one of these. You know, everybody has a camera. Everybody has a camcorder. I mean, remember when you started doing paranormal? We got in the paranormal. Oh. I was trying to take and film the CVS to get it processed. And expensive. You know, if you wanted instantaneous, you had to have a Polaroid camera at $2 a car. Or a VCR that with a tape this big, you had to stick yeah. it there and... And you had three hours on it. Yeah. And the camcorders were as big as, you know. Yeah, and $600 a piece. All right. Now you got it on your cell phone. And, right. and um, there's a lot of ghost hunters that, and misconceptions back when cell phones were bricks. Yeah. But nowadays, I think this is the greatest tool a paranormal investigator can have. It's the uh, most versatile tool. I know we disagree on that. Yeah. We can well, have a whole discussion good. on that one night. But... <laughs> This and I think that's one of the reasons to the internet, um, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. When people get something weird, weird video. I mean, the ring, the ring doorbell videos. Yes, I, I cannot believe how many people send me an orb flying past their door and wants to know if it's paranormal. You know, no, it's a bug. <laughs> I get it. Yeah, it's a bug. You know, it's a car. You know, you can see the car going down the road, but people are getting, ex I mean, through these things, they're getting exposed to it more and more. And I really do think this, this exposure and this, you know, our lives are basically videotaped or documented through Facebook. And I think we're being exposed to it a lot more. And the more exposure we have to it, the more we tend to, you know. Hmm. You so. know, I want to throw in one more time, because every time we talk, this comes up. And that is, okay. as much as you and I have done, and you have brought me into some incredibly haunted places, and you've backed me yeah. up on a couple, we can still disagree, and it's not a war. You know I what? Go, okay, go ahead. Finish. Go ahead. No, it's... You know, you're right. It's not a war. And even with these people, because when I did that lecture on June 12th about spiritual defense, I had a couple people that were just morally offended. I'm never coming to your event. I said it was a free event. <laughs> okay? So you're not no skin. You only come to the free, free stuff. There's no skin off my nose. Um, <laughs> but the thing is, if you two people disagree now, you got to destroy the other person. Yes. And, if, and it, as if we want to be, if this community, the paranormal community, wants to advance to any sort of real legitimacy, there has to be conversations and debate. And not just, I hate you because you don't agree with me, because through conversation, through debate, I'm going to use the term argument as a philosophical philosophical sense. Yeah. Not that you're arguing with your wife type sense. No, it's, it's a debate. Yeah. You, you have to have this because what happens is through, through these tools, you refine two ideas. And the ultimate goal is if you can discover the truth in both of them and merge them together, it's that much stronger. What we have forgotten, though, is to debate properly, you have to lose the ego right. and use facts. And people are well, not ready to do that. 
you're more worried about winning and being right than you are coming to the truth. And that's the thing. That's it. Dr. Farley, how can people get hold of you and how can they uh, call you at 2 a.m. because they got a spiritual attachment? Yeah, first of all, don't call me at 2 (laughs) a.m. Because this is what happens. You call me at 2 a.m., I run my volume all the way down, and I set my phone in front of Loki Dog, and you talk to Loki Dog all night. Right? <laughs> you know, Loki would be your spiritual advisor at that point. Um, but if you want to get a hold of me, go to seeaghost.com. You can book any tours. I and You can book my tours. I'm going to brag. I got 800 ratings, and, and I have a perfect five-star rating. Wow. Um, but you can go to seeaghost.com. My phone number's there. My email address is there. I check my email once a day. Um, the phone number to this phone that I carry, it's on there. So if you want to contact me, that's the best way to do it. This is seaghost.com. And what tours are you running now? Uh, right now, we are running the um, Lunt Haunted Neighborhood walking tour. That's my Cadillac tour, I call it. Mm-hmm. That's the tour that pays the that pays the bills. Um and I run that every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. Well, that tour also has links to Jack the Ripper, uh, oh, yes. other ghosts, haunted churches, all kinds of stories. Well, people come through with that. They think Limp Neighborhood. They think only Limp Mansion. People don't realize that there is a lot of things that happen in this neighborhood. The Limp Mansion is just a small part of it. Um, yeah, serial killers. And uh, and the History Channel is coming out with a documentary, I think, next year about St. Louis's ties to Jack the Ripper. And according to them, they're going to be able to document and prove 40 murders, Jack the Ripper murders, here in St. Louis. Now, I like, I like to see the research and how they got to that. But if they can pr- make that claim, yeah. Um, Outstanding. All right. Dr. Mark Farley with the St. Louis Paranormal Research Society. Man, I am so grateful you came in at the last minute for me. Oh, you always, always. has been awesome. I miss you. I hate the fact that you moved to North Carolina. (laughs) I do miss St. Louis, and I do miss you and your your team because I work so well with them. They're really great people. Okay. All right. Mark, you take care of yourself, and uh, we'll talk again real soon. I'm hoping to get into Herman with you. Oh. I hope so, too. All right, brother. You have a good one, Dan. Take care. All right, friends. That was, again, Dr. Mark Farley, seeaghost.com for the tours of the Lemp Mansion, the Lemp Brewery, the Lemp Neighborhood, and and far more than that. And more to the point, it's not someone who's just getting an hourly wage to, to yak. I remember telling people in the past when I was teaching concealed carry, you don't know what you're doing with your gun. Don't ask the kid making minimum wage at Walmart what ammo you need. Find someone who knows. So same thing. If you got questions, go to someone who knows. And that's just about it for us. So you all stay spooked. <laughs>